Just give me a moment. Madam, please give us important questions. I lost the connection. I'll try to give important questions, whatever is possible. So till then, let us just like, you know, start looking at it. Um, just a second. I'm having network issues today for all the rare days, you know, so I'm like not exactly able to open things fast and all that. But anyway, if you see, um, So when it comes to final molasses, you will see that, you know, uh, excuse me. Thank you. Extreme left side, I can please go. Right. So when it comes to phylum mollusca, we get to see that, you know, we are going to see the general characteristics. And then we have one particular type study that is Pila globosa. So what exactly is mollusca and, you know, how are they different from the other invertebrate phyla? How do they play a role in the ecosystem and what is their contribution towards man? So phylum mollusca, they're basically soft-bodied, bilaterally symmetrical, segmented, coelomate animals. And they have a shell with a mantle, a ventral foot, anterior head, and a dorsal visceral mass. So mollusks are found almost everywhere that is possible. So these include the snails, mussels, oysters, cuttlefish, squids, uh, pearl nautilus, that is your pearl mother, all of these. And they are, uh, they contribute quite a bit to the, uh, what do you call it, uh, the ecosystem, in fact. And when you see the name mollusca, mollus means, mollus means soft in Latin. And it was first used by the French zoologist Cubier in year 1798, in fact. So they have been there since quite some time. In fact, more than 500 million years since then, you know, this Precambrian and mollusks have been there. And they uh, today, the oldest of the mollusks resemble today's Nautilus. That is another creature, which is a mollusk. So the older ones resemble the Nautilus. And nearly around 1,30,000 species of molluscans have been identified and some of them are around 35,000 which have been fossilized. So when it comes to the general characteristics, you get to see that, you know, it is uh, body is unsegmented and uh, it is uh, triploblastic again, bilaterally symmetrical, mollusks, you know, uh, such as the gastropods, there is this particular uh, Symmetry wherein the primary symmetry is bilateral, but the secondary symmetry is uh, like the bilateral symmetry is lost and because of torsion, turning around or twisting, it gets another uh, symmetry. And then there is uh, the body is present in a loose fleshy lobe, which is known as the mantle. There is a shell that is present. Uh, it can be present or absent, but the shell is, is secreted by the mantle. And uh, uh, the shell can be either having a single valve or two valves that is univalvia or bivalvia and it's made up of calcite or argonite or calcium carbonate crystals. Foot is made up of uh, the ventral body wall basically is modified into a flat or wedge shaped foot. Visceral mass is fleshy and it is a back of the uh, muscles and mollusks in fact and they secrete slime. This helps in or this mucus basically helps in defense it uh, helps in water uh, retention, nutrition, reproduction, you name it. It is because of that, this particular one. And you get to see in digestive system, it is complete. Again, it has cilia inside the digestive system. There's a mouth and anus. And the stomach 
digestive system is slightly complex. There is a feature called radula, which helps in uh, uh, feeding. Radula is absent in one class called as pellicicoda. And when it comes to the respiratory system, it is either by gills or tinidia that are present in the mantle cavity. Respiratory pigment is hemocyanin. And that is a blue-green color uh, pigment, which is loaded with oxygen again. And uh, when it comes to the circulatory system, there is an open type of circulatory system. And excretion is by nephridia and uh, also, by kidney, uh, the, also by kidneys. When it comes to sense organs and nervous systems, again, complex nervous system having uh, quite a number of ganglia present, plural pedal regions, and a network of interconnecting uh, nerve cords. Statocysts are the organs of equilibrium, and they are generally present as osphridia, and they help in monitoring the water quality, in fact, when the, the amount of water that goes and comes out of the organism. And when it comes to the reproductive system, most of them are dioecious. Some of them are bisexual, that is hermaphrodites. But uh, it is exactly like, you know, uh, that's what. But then most of them are dioecious. And they're mostly oviparous. Some of them are viviparous in nature. Uh, you're not able to see, right? Just a second. Give me a minute. So development is di indirect. You have some larval forms as well. And uh, there are different types of larval stages, which are trochophore, veliger, and glochidium. Right. So when it comes to the classification of mollusca, you get to see that they are divided into six classes. And uh, quite a number of uh, scientists have given different kinds of uh, classifications as such. So in case, you know, all of them are marine, except uh, what do you call it, uh, that, uh, uh, that's what. And the difference between the uh, classes are that, you know, some of the classes such as Cordophobias are burrowers, and some of them are detritus or bottom mi dwelling microorganisms. So in, in any case, the classification that is given in your book has around uh, eight classes. So first one is Cordophoviata, then second is Solenogastas, third is class Monoplacophora, fourth is Caphophora, Gastropoda, Bivalvia, and Cephalopoda. So the first two classes, I'll just like, you know, go through from the textbook. You can just always, you know, have a look at the textbook. So class Cordophoviata is one small class having only marine worm-like mollusks that, you know, burrow in the mud. Very small size, in fact, nutrition by microorganisms and detritus. And uh, body has uh, a very few distinct regions being uh, like, you know, it's um, demarcated by a ring of constriction about the neck, basically. And posterior bears a cavity, which is uh, containing the bipectinate gills and the openings of the mantle and the cloaca. Again, they are dioecious, eggs are present in the clo uh, cloacal pouch. Development has a free swimming trochophore larva, that is the ketoderma example. And you have the second class that is solenogaster. Solenogasters are again worm like only, narrowed body, uh, around 0.8 to 30 centimeters. And uh, they are uh, in another order for, along with the polyplacophora. And they are included in the class Amphineura. And they're predominantly deep water invertebrates. They are found very deeply, that is around 3,000 meters in depth. Body plan is similar to that called of foveates and no gills, no radula, and all of it is regenerate in the nature and head is again reduced. So again, they're hermaphrodites and there is a brood pouch present. Eggs are brooded in the posterior cloacal cavity. Example is neumenia and ketoderma. So the third class is monoplacophora. Body is bilaterally symmetrical, have been there since the uh, time of Cambrian periods, in fact. And they're also known as limpets. And the head is reduced, but bears a mouth with oral tentacles and radula. Foot is broad and flat with eight pairs of uh, pedal retractor muscles. And you have a mantle that encircles the whole body as a circular fold. And again, five pairs of gills, intestine coiled, and six pairs of nephridia, and you have a radula. Two heart with has two pairs of auricles and a single ventricle. Uh, human beings heart has two auricles, two ventricles, if you get to know. So if you see, like, you know, in the 
circulatory system is quite well developed by the time it comes to molluscans. So you get to see two auricles and a single ventricle. And the nervous system has a longitudinal pallial and pedal cords and they are dinaceous. Example is neopolina. When it comes to amphineura, again, uh, body is uh, reduced. Uh, this is what they have told about, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, the solenogasters and cordophobiata. So these are there in the class amphineura. So I'll just like, you know, start with class polyplacophora and uh, then go ahead with it. Bodies again dorsoventrally flattened. They're known as chitons basically. And they have a small head, no eyes, tentacles, and the radular mantle, foot, external gills. All of them are present basically. Posteriorly, mantle cavity is present. The shell has eight calcareous dorsal plates. This is a specific uh, characteristic. And the heart pumps the blood to the gills, then excretion by a single pair of nephridia. Nervous system again with nerve cords, no ganglia though. Then osphradia is present, acts as a sense organ. Diaceous, no copulation, but external fertilization is seen. And uh, then there is a trochophore lava. Example is chiton, which is also known as the coat of male shell. The class fifth one is Scaphopoda. So they are, uh, uh, they've been there since quite a lot of time. In fact, ordovician period. And they're also known as tusk shells or tooth shells. The shell is cone-shaped, secreted by the mantle. And uh, then they're exclusively marine creatures. Bodies, again, bilaterally symmetrical, elongated, enclosed in a tusk shell, opens at both ends. And conical foot is present, but radula is present, but no gills. Mantle cavity is completely around the body. It encloses the body. Mouth is by lobular processes or outgrowths. Heart is rudimentary. Kidneys are paired, but a single gonad is present. They are dioecious. Again, the larval form is trochophore. Example is dentalium and cadulus and pulsilla. When it comes to the other uh, part, you have trochophore as well as valigial larvae. Both of them depends again. And... Uh, then when it, come, when it comes to the gastropods, you get to see they are again present in quite a number of different environments. Body is unsegmented, asymmetrically typical uh, with univalve, which is spirally coiled. Foot is ventral, broad, broad, flat, muscular. They have an operculum at the posterior end. Torsion is seen sometimes during the developmental stages. There is a mantle cavity that is present between the body wall and itself. Buccal cavity has an odontophore having a radula bearing chitinous teeth. Digestive system comprises of muscular pharynx, long esophagus, stomach, long coil, intestine, and anterior placed anus. Gills uh, respiration is by tinnidia. And uh, you get to see that uh, wall. Uh, it is also taking place by the mantle cavity in some of the forms. You also have an open circulatory system. Heart is Can enclosed in a, a pericardium. And uh, then you get to see that the open circulatory system and heart are present in the pericardium. Excretory system has metanephridia and a single nephridium in most of the forms. Distinct cerebral, pleural, and buccal, pedal, parietal, and visceral ganglia are present. And dioecious forms are there. And development is by two different kinds of lava, that is trochophore and villager. So examples are pila, that is apple snail. We are going to have a look at it in some time. And then you have Patella, Aplysia, Cypria. Cypria is a cowrie. Uh, you must have seen these examples, especially, you know, like uh, if you go onto the beaches, you get to see these, you know, the snails, shells, like, you know, the uh, uh, you get to find them on the beach, basically. They get washed out. So the next class is Bivalvia uh, by or Pelicipoda or Lamelli Branchiata. These are the different orders and uh, sub uh, classes that are present. You, I'll just like you know, kind of share them with you, but later. So when it comes to Pelicipoda, they are again exclusively, uh, uh, mostly marine. Some of them have fresh water, but there are no terrestrial bivalves present. Some can live as free livings or as uh, commensals or parasitic uh, species. They are mostly sedentary filter feeders present and. Uh, uh, they also have, you You know, you have this giant Pacific clams that is uh, tridacna, which can weigh up to around 500 pounds, that is around 250 kilos. 
So as the name shall suggest, bivalvia means there are two valves. And the bivalve shells are hinged together mid-dorsally. Head is disc not exactly uh, clear. There are so along with the pharynx, jaws, radular tentacles. The foot is ventral muscular, which is like a plow shape. That is why pelisi poda. And mantle is bilobed, having a paired right and left lobes. Gills or telhedia are paired, one on each side. Coelom is reduced by the dorsally placed pericardium. And the heart is contained with the pericardium, compresses of a median uh, ventricle to auricles. And uh, paired nephridia or kidneys open at one end into the pericardium and to the other end into the exterior. So again, four pairs of ganglia are present in the nervous system, cerebral, pleural, pedaral, visceral. So cerebral and, uh, cerebral and plural are present on each side as a single entity that is a cerebroplural ganglion. And sense organs are statosis or ospredia. Sexes are separate or united. Development is accompanied by metamorphosis, which includes one larval form, that is the trochophore larva. Again, you have different kinds of uh, examples in this. So you get to see uh, development, uh, like I told you, it is either trochophore larva or veliger larva also. And uh, you in the bivalve a larval stage called as glochidium is seen. This is a par parasitic uh, larva attaches to the host by means of byssus threads. So they are economically important. In fact, lamellidens or unio is a freshwater mussel. And mitilus is a sea mussel, austria, edible oyster, pink tada, pearl oyster, teredo, shipworm, uh, solen is a razor clam or razor shell. So this is all about the pelisipoda. So next we are going to the, see the cephalopoda. Again, they uh, belong to this. Uh, they are very highly organized, marine as well as free swimming. Octopus, squids, cuttlefish, nautilus are all like, you know, uh, from this branch, cephalopoda. Cephalus means head, podos means foot. So they can be pelagic or benthic, meaning they can be bottom dwelling or restricted to a certain uh, continental shelf or slope. So again, you have the giant squid, which is Architeuthis, is the largest living invertebrates that is present. It's more than 20 meters in length. And the body is um, uh, like, you know, it, it is like slightly elongated with extended tentacles. And uh, then, you know, uh, body is streamlined to saccular bottom dwelling forms. And you have quite a number of uh, extensive uh, information regarding Unautilus, which is an external shell, with, uh, which reduces the shell basically. The shell in cuttlefish uh, is internal. Squids also have a reduced internal shell called as a pen. Octopuses do not have a shell only, and uh, but it bears a pair of highly developed eyes, mouth, number of arms or tentacles, and uh, suckers in the octopuses or argonauts. So you have squids and cuttlefishes with eight arms and two tentacles. And Nautilus has about 90 small suckerless appendages. And viscera is covered with a dome-shaped or elongated sheath of the muscle, the mantle, with a pair of jaws and a rasping tongue. And all the members are having closed type of circulatory system of the blood vessels. And um, three hearts, main systemic heart, Two branchial hearts, one at the base of each gill. Excretion is uh, carried out uh, by kidneys, and there are four kidneys in Nautilus. Central nervous system is highly developed. Major ganglionic centers are present in it. And uh, dioecious creatures, these are all. And one of the arms is hecta, hectocotylized in males, in fact. This helps in the sperm transfer, basically. And during copulation, the male uses one of the arms to remove a spermatophore and place it in the mantle cavity of a female. So this is how it is, uh, the fertilization takes place. Fertilized eggs are attached to the substratum and sometimes attended by the female. Direct development without any kind of metamorphosis is seen. Example is sapia, loligo, architeuthis, octopus. So how the shell, uh, yeah, like, you know, what do you call it? The shell is present, they have given that. So now this is all about uh, the different kinds of, uh, what do you call it, um, species and the classes in the molluscans. Now we'll just like, you know, have a look at Pila globosa, that is the apple snail. Please give me a minute, I will share the screen again.
anyway, I'll start explaining instead of just uh, like no. Um, I'm looking at it basically where is my lab. So in Vaila Globosa, you have a certain number of important questions also, basically. So when it comes to that, you know, how a shell of Vaila Globosa is present, that is one important question. And in uh, Molaska, you know, general characters of class bivalvia, this is also an important question. And uh, uh, the freshwater prawn, again, you have the gills of Pelimon, that is also an important question, already asked, basically. So important questions, I will try to share them with you. Otherwise, like, you know, let me see what can be done. If you go to the university, Kishore sir also will be able to help. So anyway, when it comes to Pila Globosa, uh, there's uh, like, you know, uh, it belongs to Phyla Molaska, class Gastropoda, subclasses Prosobranchieta, uh, order is Pectini Branchieta, Genus is Pila, species is Globosa. It's a freshwater gastropod mollusk present in ponds, pools, tanks, etc. And very commonly known as the apple slale. Lives in water masses wherever there is aquatic vegetarian uh, vegetation that is available. And when you come to the external uh, characteristics of Pila, you see that the shell is globular in, in fact. So it is there in your textbook. You can just have a look at it. So uh, then the top of the shell is like, you know, it is a walled type of uh, shell with a columella, which is a wall. And the top of the shell is called as the apex. And from there you have around five and a half to six and a half walls that are present. And then you get to see that all these walls, uh, the la last wall is the largest wall and is known as the body uh, wall. And closest the em entire amount of body, in fact, and its opening is, uh, it uh, opens to the exterior through an umbilicus. And this is, uh, this umbilicus is known as perforator umbilicated. So if the shell of pila is held with apex, so you get to see that it is a, so you have right hand coiling and left hand coiling in the gastropods. So if it is clockwise, it is known as sinistral. If it is on the anti-clockwise direction of uh, the, uh, like, you know, walls present, it is known as the dextral kind of, uh, uh, shell. So this is again hereditary and you can see that right-handedness is dextral and it is dominant over the left-handedness that is the sinistral. So when the uh, animal withdraws into the shell, mouth is closed and then you know it is closed by a plate which is known as the operculum. It is attached to the posterior dorsal part and it has this operculum outside has a number of rings around the nucleus that is present. And the shell is made up of calcium carbonate and conchiolin. Has three layers. And when you see the structure of the soft part, again, we'll just come to that. So these special organs are also present, which are the osphradium, a single osphradium paired eye statocyst and tentacles. So this osphradium hangs from the mantle near the pseudopodium oval with around 20 to 20, uh, 22 to 28 fleshy leaflets. And you, these statocysts help in equilibrium and uh, uh, regulation of the position of the snail, basically. And eyes are oval capsules made up of retina, pigmented sensory cells, thin, non-pigmented transparent cornea is also present. So optic nerve is present, innervates the retinal cells. The spelling of retina is wrong here. It should be R-E-T-I-N-A-L. Eyes are sensory to light. So the tentacles and the food are li liberally supplied with nerves. They are sensory to uh, contacts. Tentacles contain both the tactile and chemoreceptor cells and probably gustatory cells also. This is the first pair of tentacles are olfactory. And again, in uh, the reproductive system, the sexes are separate, that is dioecious. There is a definite uh, um, sexual dimorphism. Male is smaller, female is uh, slightly larger and more swollen in size. And there is a well-developed copulatory organ in the male, but it is rudimentary in the female. And the male reproductive system has the testes, rasar efferentia, vas deferens, and terminal glandular part of the vas deferens. There is also a penis with its sheath and four, uh, like, you know, you have the hypobranchial glands. And the testis is flat, uh, plate-like, wheatish structure made up of 
uh, which is like triangular mostly and situated in the upper part of the first walls of the shell. The location is important. The cream color textus is easily distinguished from the digestive glands that are brownish or dirty green in color. And you have the vasa efferentia that lead downwards from the different parts of the testes. They unite before opening into the vas difference. So vas difference again, at the posterior end comes from the thin vas difference, has three distinct parts, that is the proximal, uh, tubular, vesicular seminalis, and thick glandular portion, which opens near the uh, into the mantle cavity near the anal opening. So in the uh, mantle cavity, again, the vast difference lies uh, uh, closely attached to the left side of the rectum and ends in a prominent claw-shaped structure, the genital papilla having the male genital apparatus, which is a little behind the anus. This is how the male reproductive organs, male copulatory organs in the surface and how the sperms also look. So the edge of the mantle bears this inner surface with the thick glandular flap, which is of yellowish color. Flap is attached on the right side, free on the left though, and the penis is capable of extension. So you also have hypobranchial glands, which um, which help in what do you call it? Uh, they are present at the base of the penis and uh, consist of tall cells which have a uh, small nuclei. In fact, and uh, spermatogenesis is what uh, has been done by our Indian scientists only. Again, you have two different kinds of uh, sperms, eupyrine sperm and oligopyrene sperm. So eupyrine sperms are those which have hair-like and they are elongated, spirally twisted, and they move actively towards the spiral course and measure around 25 microns in length and 1.2 microns in breadth. They can only fertilize the eggs. And oligopyrene sperms are again, they have very sluggish serpent-like movement and they are uh, secondary in function, basically. So when it comes to the female reproductive system, please give me a moment. Yeah, so in the female reproductive system, it has ovary with uh, a minute ducts, oviduct, receptaculum seminis, a uterus, vagina, and the hypobranchial glands. So it lies in the same position as, as, as that, that of the testis, but again, it is not as extensive as the testis. Ovary is branched, the structure having, uh, and it becomes uh, dark orange in color after the matured individuals are like you know are fully in, uh, matured in fact the branches of this ovary has a single layer uh, which of sni made up of uh, flask shaped cells and there is this ovary duct which is present which is narrow transports the ovary duct originates from the middle of the ovary runs anteriorly along the inner margin and opens near the renal gland organ and uh, enters into the receptaculum cells and this receptaculum seminis is a bean-shaped structure, thin world pouch arises directly. So it is also known as the pouch of receptaculum. So there is a large uterus, which is pear shaped deep yellow in color. And uh, what happens is it is connected to the outside with the receptaculum seminis. So the vagina is present. It is a white or cream in color band-like structure laying immediately beneath the skin. Extends from the uterus to the upper end of the columnar muscle and it enters the mantle cavity uh, and uh, it is situated on the small papilla a little behind the anus in fact. You have a hypobranchial gland in the females which is poorly developed and rudimentary. And then when it comes to the copulation part, the female is the rudimentary penis laying beneath the glandular fold at the edge of the mantle. There is no trace of the foldings of the penis sheet. So fertilization takes place in the uterus. Oviposition starts a day or two later. Fertilized eggs are laid in masses around 200 to 800 in moist earth. Again, development, you have two different larval forms, trochophore and villager. And free swimming trochophore is present only in some primitive gastropods such as the diatocardia. And the others, it's passed through the egg. So, now let me just like, you know, kind of uh, 
tell you about uh, the whatever else is given in your textbook basically so when you see the digestion and the respiratory part please come to that so there is this digestive gland which is known as hepatopancreas lying in the visceral mass uh, page number 247 you can please follow that and when it comes to food and digestion food of pila has is basically made up of aquatic weeds so it is cut by the jaws mixed and it is uh, intracellular digestion that is taking place and respiration is by uh, uh, like you know water from the outside enters into the nuchal lo lobe which is the left nuchal lobe enters into the branchial chamber to the right nuchal lobe to outside so this is how the aquatic uh, respiration takes place when it comes to the aerial surfaces aerial respiration is uh, by uh, like you know the left nuchal lobe elongates forms a tubular structure which is known as a respiratory siphon and then from there uh, the air can get inside and air enters the pulmonary sac through the respiratory siphon and uh, then it goes out through the left nuchal lobe so this is all about the respiration when it comes to the vascular system again it is complex double mode of respiration is present aortic trunk uh, arises from the ventricle divides into two branches that is an anterior cephalic aorta and posterior propulsion of the blood so the heart aortic arches ampulla are enclosed in the pericardial cavity visceral aorta supplies blood to the stomach esophagus general duct rectum etc so when you come see the different kind the course of uh, circulation you get to see figure uh, 10.9 you can just follow in your textbook you have cephalic and visceral aorta giving rise to different kind uh, different organs of the body so perivisceral sinus to pulmonary to pulmonary vein to auricles to ventricles to cephalic and visceral aorta again one more part is different organs of the body perintestinal sinus efferent and efferent renal sinus efferent renal vein giving rise to from at uh, anterior renal and posterior renal chambers to efferent renal vein to efferent tenedal vein to auricles then to ventricles so this is how the circulation is taking place in pila globosa and um, when it comes to the excretory system you get to see that it is uh, the renal organ or the kidney which is the excretory organ in pila has two chambers a small anterior and a large posterior chamber uh then you know you have valves that are guarding them so then the posterior chamber lies to the left of the rectum cavity communicates with the pericardium by a reno pericardial aperture so excretory matter is mostly ammonia or ammonium compounds urea and uric acid now a system again different kinds of ganglia are present and uh, commissures connectors nerves are all associated with the different kinds of ganglia pedal pleural and pet supraintestinal all of these are ganglia and connective is the name applied to the nerves connecting two dissimilar ganglia so again in this it is a delicate nervous system the cerebral ganglion on each side is connected with the pleuropedal ganglion on the side by two connectors which is known as the cerebro pleural and cerebropedal connectors so anyway what happens is in all of these there is a somatic a somatogastric ring nerve ring also present formed by a pair of uh, buccal ganglia and you have buccal commissures as well and uh, again you have a lot of uh, connectives over there cerebro buccal connectives they are uh, formed by uh, visceral ganglion is formed by fusion of two ganglia pleural and suprainterstinal uh, nerve and they help in uh, or they innervate the tenedium pulmonary chamber digestion excretory and reproductory organs are under these particular uh, ganglia of the nerves again sense organs like i uh, you have already seen pair of eyes pair of sinuses two pairs of tentacles ostradium and controlled by pedal ganglia and reproductive system also i have uh, uh, like you know kind of showed you the uh, what do you call it um, uh, the powerpoint uh, slides in fact the same thing has been given in your textbook and when it comes to the economic importance of molluscans you get to see that gastropods are edible so you have they are used as you know for mostly for eel like you know the flesh of apple snail that is pila globosa is eaten in ap and tamil nadu and then um, other uh, like you know snails you know the flesh uh, the flesh is taken and eaten basically so main collecting season is between the february to april 
when it comes to bivalves that is oysters sea mussels and clams all of them are commercially important so you get to see uh, sea mussels oysters pearls you know giving rise to uh, pearls basically and um, again they are also edible so you know they have high nutritive value scallops and uh, clams basically and you get to see that uh the food is greatly valued by different kinds of fishing uh, communities also and fish in cephalopods not exactly found in the indian waters but uh they are again commonly used as food cuttlefish octopus few species of octopus are edible and mollusks as food for marine life also skates rays etc feed on the mollusks and when it comes to the uh, ornamental or medicinal purposes turbinellia pyrum is for uh, use as a medicine so used in treating dyspepsia piles general debility lung diseases etc cowries and uh, then uh, crassostria all of this used for gastric disorders basically and ornaments and jewelry you again you have seen you know mother of pearl lining that is halutes species attractive attractively colored and um, molluscan shells are We, we know very highly collected all over the world. In fact, they like they beautiful for that matter. And even for live manufacturing, you get to see that it is an important industry in the coastal areas of the India. So you get lime from the mollusks. And other uses is that you know they are used in the manufacture of tooth uh, pastes and tooth powders. And uh, some of them are harmful. Example is mera folas and teredo. They're known as you know they. damage the underwater ship uh, like you know wood constructions so they are known as wood borers so teredo or shipworm is almost like you know it can attain 1 meter so what they do is uh, they attack the ship's wood work so and then you have even pearl oyster culture they belong to the pearl oyster or the genus pinctada and most common uh, ones are the pinctada fucata or pinctada vulgaris found in gulf of kutch gulf of manar and pak bay and uh, calcareous secretions basically when the pearl gets irritated when the creature gets irritated that is when it secretes the pearl or the calcareous secretions so they usually found it is a big big uh, industry in fact which uh, and uh, pearl harvesting is very famous in fact so this is all about the pearl culture and pearl harvesting basically uh so we are done with mollusca now let us see photo echinodermata phylum we share once so when it comes to phylum phylum echinodermata again you've got a beautiful uh, they are beautiful creatures again as you see they are all spiny or skinny uh, celled creatures basically we are going to have one type study that is the asterius and uh, they have been there since quite some 600 million years that is from the cambrian period all onwards and uh, quite a number of uh, beautiful creatures are present in this particular uh, like phylum in fact so mostly like you know they are entirely marine in nature and free living mostly and you get to see that when it comes to the habit and the habitats exclusively marine found in different kinds of uh, depths and uh, in these deep sea so some of them are pelagic some are sessile or sedentary free living non colonial slow moving organisms size and shape again moderate sizes you have starfishes which are about 32 inches some of them are really small and uh, brittle star serpent stars are known for their large fra fragile arms basically 
and you have the body symmetry which is unsegmented but uh, they are radially symmetrical but adults have a secondary pentaradial symmetry so the body is divided into five or less similar portions around the central axis then they are triploblastic with three germinal layers and the body surface has an oral surface and an aboral surface with uh, different kinds of umbilical areas mouth is on the upper or the oral surface and uh, the other surface is termed as the aboral surface and the skeleton is made up of theca or calyx both exo and endoskeletons are present and it is that you know you have ossicles that are present that increases in size during the growth of animals again the coelom is developed line by ciliated peritoneum and they have two different types of cavities the branchial coelom and the body coelom that is the hydrocele organ systems and physiology you have a unique system called as the umbilical system and um, they uh, and uh, sorry the umbilical system or a hydrocele having uh, reservoirs ducts with watery fluid similar to the blood lymph etc so the locomotion is by umbilical system as along with the contractile feed or the podia so whatever vascular system is present which is interesting not present in any other uh, invertebrate phylum and uh, the best developed in the starfishes functions as means of locomotion and respiratory exchange complete digestive uh, digestive system from mouth to anus and uh, some groups anus is fu not functional or is completely absent so the oral or the mouth itself acts as the anus again so the circulation respiration circulatory system is called as the hemal system open simple lacunar type they have respiratory trees and uh, again some other echinoderms generally lack respiratory systems only present as a rudimentary ones that is earlier and then they have completely degenerated what a vascular system helps in the respiration excretory system again no definite uh, uh, like you know what do you call it uh, excretory system is present what a vascular system takes its place and except in class of uroidea wherein uh, you have diffusion taking place solid waste is thrown out through the mouth as it does not have anus nervous system is simple in echinoderms no cephalization only uh, that you know they do not have a brain like structure but you have a circumoral ring surrounded uh, surrounding the mouth radial rings organs of special sense are uh, present but they are inadequate inadequately developed reproductive system again the sexes are different and uh, 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 distinct sexual reproduction and gonads are interradial fertilization is external takes place in the sea, sea water development can be direct or indirect many different larval forms are present and autonomy and regeneration is also seen as in the case of uh, starfishes and considerable economic importance because they help in destroy the uh, uh, commercial or, or oysters basically so when it comes to the classification of um, so you can get to see all these are the general characters so again the classes whatever has been given earlier in your textbook and this is slightly different let us follow with your textbook and just like kind of put this a slide let it go on as such so phylum fi like echinodermata is divided into four subphyla subphylum 1 that is echinozoa again five classes heli uh, helicoplacoidea holothuroidea adrio asteroidea echinoidea and opistocetidea so again different kinds of uh, classes different kinds of characteristics present uh, free living that is helicoplacoidea free living ancient forms basically example is helio heliocoplacus and holothuroidea is the free living ancient echinoderms body is elongated something like cucumber uh, like five sided arms are absent they are sedentary in nature nerve ring surrounds the mouth spread into five radial nerves example is cucumelia and molpidia thion and you have class 3 that is adrio asteroidea again appeared during the mid cambrian period extinct by carboniferous era and uh, then examples are adrio aster and isorophus echinoidea again body is globular discoid or heart shaped enclosed in a well developed test mouth and anus are on the oral and aboral surfaces respectively 
five double rows of suctorial feet are present, 10 shrub like dermal branchia are present on the peristome. And uh, some of them have a complex jaw mechanism, such as the Aristotle's lantern present inside the mouth. So, pedicel area stopped, possess three jaws, good watervascular system. So, excretory also in function. Example is echinus, echinocardium, clypeaster, lovenia. When it comes to the fifth class, that is opistodidia, there are extinct echinoderms, polygonal plates are found on the test. And mouth is uh, five uh, with five interradial jaws. Eight pairs of the tube feet arise from the ambulacrum. Example is Volvokia. Uh, Volcovia, I mean. Then subphylum two, with the, which is the homolozoa. Again, extinct uh, echinoderms. Body is dorsoventrally flattened. Bilateral symmetry is observed. Mouth is like having a pair of arm-like organs on both the sides. U-shaped alimentary canal and tail-like peduncle is present. Example is enoplora and dendrocystis. When it comes to the third subphylum, you have only one single class, which is crinoidea. And body has a central disc, five bifurcated radial uh, radiating arms. Oral and aboral surface is present, aboral surface downwards. Feather-like in motion, flexible. Dorsal side contains ossicles. Water vascular system is ring vessel, radial vessels. Tube feet do not perform locomotions, but they capture food. Diaceous in nature, example is antidon or metacrinus. Fourth subphylum is Asterozoa, has only one single class, that is Telleroidea, free living, radially symmetrical animals, and uh, again, star shaped body, mouth and anus is present, double rows, that is ambulacral grooves are present, pedicel area are present, diaceous, indirect development, example is Asterius, Ophiotrix, and Sol Solastium. So, when it comes to the type study that is given in your textbook, I'll just like kind of uh, open that. So the type study that's been mentioned is that of the Asterius, which is no, commonly known as the starfish. So star, starfish are the sea star. So according to the starfishes, just give me a moment. Phylum Echinodermata, subphylum is Asterozoa, and uh, class is Telleroidea. Subclass Asteroidea, order is Forciculata, family is Asteridae, genus Asterius, Ru uh, species is Rubens. I request you all to stay for half an hour more so that I'll finish uh, uh, starfish, go for the uh, next chapter that is the hemichordates and then we'll be able to finish. So please bear with me. So again, they are exclusively marine or bottom dwelling or benthic, uh, benthon benthonic animals and uh, present on either sandy or rocky bottoms. They are either solitary, but under certain ecological conditions, they can be col colonial also. And all the starfishes are carnivorous. They feed on moving or sessile animals, on, uh, mostly on the polychaetes, crustaceans, mollusks, other echinoderms, and even the corpse, that is the dead bodies. So again, external fissure, if you see, it has radial symmetry, pentameras body, having five uh, oregano, what do you call it, arms that radiate from the pentagonal central disc, symmetrical space projections, and some of them, the arms can be more than five. Example is Solaster has around seven to 14 arms and more than 40 arms in one species, which is Heliaster. Very, like, you know, they're very extremely colorful in nature. Body again has uh, two surfaces, upper convex or aboral or abactinal, lower surface is flat, less pigmented, called as the oral or actinal surface. So oral and aboral are not ventral and dorsal surfaces, but correspond to the left and right sides of the bilateral symmetry, uh, symmetrical uh, larva, in fact. So the well-defined head is entirely absent. And when it comes to the oral surface of the body, it is in a natural condition. What happens is it is towards the substratum and it is flat, either a dark orange to purplish, color and this has the mouth, ambulacral grooves, tube feet or podia, ambulacral spines, sense organs, all of these are present and this is the aboral surface which has the anus. So on the top you have the anus, a minute circular aperture situated close to the center of the central disc of the aboral surface. 
you also have a madriporite all the avoral surface uh, you have this madriporite plate between the two bases of the two or of the five arms basically again presence of madriporite depends upon the individuals and they are collectively known as or referred to as the bivium and the other three are known as the trivium the arms so symmetrical position of madriporite thus converts the radial symmetry into the bilateral symmetry again spines are present on the aboral surface which can be blunt calcareous spines or tubercles and you have papillae or gills that are present through this dermal pores that are present basically you have a, a small delicate tubular uh, thread like gills or a gill branchia or gill or papilla that is uh, that come out so internally they are lined by coelho and uh, they have respiratory as well as ex excretory functions and when it comes to the pedicel area you get to see that they have besides the spines and the gills entire aboral surface is having tiny pincers or jaws called as the ped pedicel area so and uh, then uh, they have calcareous pieces and a stalk called as the fasciculate pedunculate pedicel area so asterius again has two different kinds of fasciculate pedunculate uh, pedicel area one is the straight type and the other is the cross type so the straight type pedicel area is simple jaws are more or less straight attached basically to the basal piece and um, there are two pairs of adductor muscles for closing the jaws two pairs of abductor muscles for opening them when it comes to the cross type again you have that you know they have mandibles that uh, cross each other like the man mandibles of a cross bill which is a bird basically so that the basal piece is enclosed between the cross portions so what happens is they serve as defensive and offensive organs protect the gills general body surface by keeping the body surface free from debris and organisms like sponges and cilentaries setting or sitting on the body basically so again the body wall of asterius has cuticle epidermis nervous layer basement membrane dermis muscular layer coelomic epithelium endoskeleton all of these are present basically so cuticle is outermost layer uh, and covers the body externally thin two layer then you have the epidermis and uh, this lies beneath the cuticle made up of ciliated epithelium extensions all over different kinds of cells are present which are neurosensory in origin then pigment gra uh, granules club shaped gland cells the nerve plexus is present in uh, which is a nerve uh, fiber uh, layer basically having different kinds of ganglia nerve fibrils and then there is a basement membrane which is delicate and separates the epidermis and the nerve plexus from the uh, dermis dermis lies beneath the uh, epidermis has a continuous fibrous connective tissue and thickest layer of the body basically and again two layers are there outer body layer and two regions outer and inner outer dermal region secretes uh, the endoskeletal ossicles inner dermal region has uh, blood containing spaces called as the perihemal spaces then you have the musculature consisting of two smooth muscle layers circular and longitudinal helping in the movement basically and when it comes to the coelomic epithelium it is uh, also known as a peritoneum in a most layer has flagellated cuboid cells and it is mesodermal in origin when it comes to the endoskeleton in case of asterius you get to see that there is an endoskeleton which is very rigid and uh, there are ossicles that are present and also each ossicle is made up of a calcite and ossicles are on the aboral surface and the following are the ossicles that are found in the body basically oral ossicles ambulacral uh, ossicles uh, you can see this is the transverse section of an arm basically so oral or, uh, ossicles ambulacral ossicles and ambulacral ossicles supra and intra infra marginal ossicles and you have a coelom also that is a body cavity called as a visceral peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum and uh, coelomic fluid is colorless has uh, coelomocytes in them and it has uh, the coelomic fluid plays the role of the blood carries on the respiration so when it comes to the uh, 
sorry i thought i was like you know sharing my screen with you i will send i will send this particular uh, uh particular uh, link to you so that you know you have not missed anything as such all of this is given in your textbook also you just can follow it so when it comes to the digestive system again it has elementary canal and digestive glands elementary canal is straight occupies the central disc and extends from the oral to the aboral surface and uh, see this is a picture of the digestive system in fact and you have mouth esophagus stomach intestine rectum and anus mouth is at the central of the oral surface and surrounded by peristomial membranes mouth has a sphincter muscle opens into the stomach aborally so you have a cardiac stomach and a pyloric, a pyloric stomach also that is present in the different uh, in the oral parts and uh, then the cardiac stomach is glandular and saculated aborally it opens into the pyloric stomach which is the second part on the aboral uh, uh, surface in fact it is much smaller and you you have a duct that is uh, radial in position to that of the pyro pyloric stomach and this duct enters the corresponding arms forms a pair of large appendages called as the pyloric cecum hepatic cecum branchial cecum digestive glands gastric glands etc so again you have an intestinal or rectal cecum and then you have this rectum opening out through the anus uh, centrally located on the central uh, disc on the aboral surface so digestive glands the pyloric cecum are the digestive glands basically so when it comes to the physiology of digestion both extracellular and intracellular digestion takes place so what happens is digestive enzymes are poured over the visceral mass of the oyster so then these convert the proteins into peptones starch into maltose fats into fatty acids and glycerols in product of fatty acids then this starfish retracts its cardiac stomach into the body along with the partially digested food so only the shell of the oyster is present so then the digestion is completed in the stomach and the pyloric cecum then digested food diffuses into the ciliary fluid gets distributed to all the parts of the body so whatever undigested food is there it comes out through the mouth because the anal aperture remains small so we have something which is very important which is the water vascular system in the starfish or as as terius so it is a modified part of the stilo silo and helps in maintaining the hydraulic pressure mechanism basically it is unique and present only in the echinoderms and it consists of the madreporite you can see them in the pictures stone canal ring canal tightmans vesicles polyne uh, polyen vesicles radial canals lateral canals and tube feet so when it comes to the madreporite you get to see that uh, uh, this is the madreporite basically uh, present interradially between the bivium and the uh, surface of the central disc and uh, then a total around 200 to 250 madreporites can be present and each pore opens into a short pore canal pore canals unite into the collecting canals these open into uh, the structure called as ampulla which is below the madreporite so ampulla opens into the stone canal now the stone canal whatever is present is actually s shaped vertical also called as the madreporite canal and it is complicated basically having a a, a different uh, what do you call it um, the it is uh, what do you call it it is a simple tube in the embryonic stages in the young gastrius but in the adult form what happens is um, it uh, has two spirally coiled lamellae these lamellae branch making the lumen more complicated so finally the stone canal passes downwards opens into the ring canal stone canal is s shaped vertical also called as the madreporic canal i think they have just like you know kind of repeated that paragraph in your textbook ring canal is present this ring canal is also called as the umbilical ring canal and it is pentagonal and situated around the mouth inner side is having a peristomial ring of fossicles and above is the hyponeural ring sinus you also have around five pairs of interradial racemos tidmans bodies and that are yellowish irregular or round and 10th uh, um, tidmans body is absent in its position is occupied by the stone canal so function is not exactly known supposedly they have lymphatic uh, function and bud off amoeboid cells from the walls so when it comes to the polyen vesicles 
you get to see that in the pollen vesicles you have uh, um, uh, it is an elongated pear shaped uh, muscular sac along with the ne long neck but in asteriidae what is happening is this uh, pollen vesicles are absent except in asterina globosa and thenia flavicina having two astropectin having around four function is not exactly known but may be lymphatic or amoeboidal in nature Radial canals that are present, the radial canals give out the outer margin, five ciliated radial canals. They are below the ambulacral ossicles. So when it comes to the lateral canals again, please watch this picture, you'll get the idea. These are the lateral or the podial canals basically. Uh, they are long and short. These are the lateral canals or the podial canals having the tube feet. Each lateral canal is attached to the ampulla of the two cube feet. Valve is present so that there is no backward flow of water. We are le uh, learning about the water vascular system basically. So that is the reason uh, this is uh, preventing the backward flow of water. And tube feet, they are present externally on either side of the ambulacral groove in two alternating rows. Altogether, four rows of podia appear instead of two on each ambulacral groove basically. So same picture is given in your textbook, in fact. So each, uh, each tube foot is hollow, elastic, thin walled cylinders or sac-like structure. One ampulla, podium and sucker is present. And when it comes to the water current, you get to see that water enters the ring canal. This is the ring canal, right? So water enters into the ring canal through the madriporite and stone canal. From the ring canal, it goes into the radial canals and then the lateral canals into the tube feet. And then from the tube feet outside. So it is locomotion, uh, which is the most important fact or function of the water vascular system. Locomotion. Locomotion is because of the vascular system, water vascular system, basically. So different kinds of locomotion is there. So it can either, uh, like, you know, move on the horizontal surface or on vertical surfaces also. This is with the help of the ampulla and the tube feed, basically, and the uh, presence of the sucker through which it goes on to the horizontal uh, uh, foot. So what happens is animal is drawn forward by the contracting tube feet, and then the suckers get relaxed then detach with the, from the substratum and then the process gets released. So when a tube foot contracts, the animal is moved by the length of the tube foot. And when asterias, that is the starfishes, want to climb the vertical surfaces, so what happens is alternate contraction and relaxation along with adherence, that is sticking of the suck suckers to the substratum, makes the animal move upward or forward. So... Uh, the movement of asterius is again slow and steady, moves around 15 centimeters in a minute. You also have a perihelial system basically. So circulatory system in asterius has two different kinds. One is the system and the hemal system. Perihemal system like the vertebrascular system is derived from the celo, has many tubular celomic silences such as axial, aboral, genital radial perihemal sinuses and uh, so again description is given of all the different kinds of sinuses also please focus on the picture then i will read so this encloses the axial sinus encloses the so stone canal and the axial gland and uh, communicates with the ampulla of the stone canal basically and there are five pairs of genital sinuses arising from the aboral ring sinus each has a pair of, uh, each arm has these kind of sinuses. They surround the gonads. Oral ring sinus is also called as the peripuckle or hyponeural perihemal ring sinus. Large tubular oblique circular septum called as the hemal strand divides the oral ring into outer wide and inner uh, outer narrow. Inner narrow and outer wide ring. And then you have a radial perihemal sinus also known as the radial hyponeural sinus. There are uh, five of them, uh, five of these arising, and they extend five branches into different podia, and they are connected to radial perihemals by again fine lateral channels. 
Peribranchial sinuses are also present. They are circular. They surround the basal part of gills or papillae. So when it comes to the hemal system, you get to see that in the hemal system, also called as the blood lacunar system, it is reduced. So what happens is, uh, again, it is of open type with a celiomic epithelial ring. You have this, uh, it is derived from the blastocene. And uh, the system having the celomic fluid, it has the celomocytes and enclosed in the celomic spaces of the perihemal system. System consists of the oral hemal ring, radial hemal sinuses or strands, axial gland and aboral hemal ring. So just below the ring canal, it is present basically and divides the hyponeural sinus and it is connected to the aboral hemal ring through the axial glands. Radial hemal sinuses or strands are, uh, arise radially from the oral uh, hemal ring. They are present below the ambulacral groove and just below the radial canal of the water vascular system. They give off branches to the different kinds of podia, that is the feet. Axial gland or axial organ is present. It is uh, um, like, you know, you really do not know the exact function of it. It was known as the mysterious organ. And it is usually referred to variously as the heart, ovoid gland, dorsal organ, septal organ, or brown gland for that matter. And uh, spaces are filled with fluid having amoeboid, amoeboid uh, celomocytes that have a brown pigment. And uh, so it has no connection with the uh, ampulla or the stone canal. And uh, then a pair of the gastric tufts from the cardiac stomach open into the axial gland near the aboral surface. Through these gastric tufts, digested food enters into the hemal circulation. So when it comes to the aboral hemal ring, you get to see that it is a pentagonal ring. You have around five pairs of genital hemal rings that are strands that are coming out or extend to the gonads. And Hyman had named this axial sinus, stone canal and axial organ together as an axial complex. Again, when it comes to the functions, pathway for distribution of food, circulation of food, contractile activity, even for uh, like you know, uh, production of sex cells. And uh, so again, lymphatic function is also seen, but again, doubtful function that is. So basically it is for production of uh, the sex cells, distribution of food, and uh, then even circulation. So when it comes to respiratory and excretory system of the asterius, then the respiratory organs of the asterius are the gills of the papillae and the hey. So um, I request you all, I'll, I'll, I'll finish even hemicordates and then, you know, I'll relieve you. So if it is okay with you, because we this is our last class today. So uh, uh, please stay, like, you know, even after 5.30. So respiration is by uh, uh, dermal branchiae or papillae, basically. Oxygen is drawn in, carbon dioxide is given out, and partly also performed by the tube feet. When it comes to excretion, special organ, uh, organs of excretion are absent. Elimination is by amoebocytes. Waste are carried to the dermal branchiae, skin and tube feet. Then it is discharged outside. You again have quite a bit of nervous system that is present at different levels. You have an oral or an ectoneural or epidermal nervous system. This comprises of nerve ring, radial nerves, subepidermal nerves, deep or hyponeural nervous system. A boral or serumic uh, or entoneural nervous system and the visceral nervous system. Again, slightly uh, like you know, even if it is simple, it is simple, but again, uh, they have sensory or motor nerves that are present basically. So different kinds of nerves give rise to uh, like different kinds of receptors basically. And when it comes to the sense organs, poorly developed sense organs are seen. Eyes uh, are the most significant ones present and uh, they're pigmented. Uh, so they have uh, several photoreceptors or eye pits or ocellate, around uh, 80 to 200 in different species for that matter. Then you have the retinal cells that are present in between the pigment cells. And as it's based, the pigment cells continue as a fiber, join the radial nerve cord, eye pit, then it is transparent gelatinous tissue that is present inside this eye pit. Eyes are the photoreceptors and uh, 
So some species of Asterias, they have positively phototropic, while some of them are negatively phototropic. That is, if they see light, they move away from the light. Neurosensory cells are present all over the body. They are known as the tangoreceptors or chemoreceptors. Um, so what happens is they are fusiform. They are present on the suckers of the podia at all different places. That is all over the body. So when it comes to the reproductive system of Asterias, again, their uh, success is di uh, separate. That is dioecious. Uh, Asterias rubens is a hermaphrodite. And some of them are protandric, some of them are, uh, uh, what do you call it, the reproductive organs of Asterias are simple and uh, copulatory organs, accessory glands, receptacles for storage of ova, spermatozoa, all are entirely absent. Go only the gonads are present. Then these gonads are round and female gonads are the ovaries. And morphologically, both look similar in fact. And uh, one pair of gonads is present on the proximal part of each arm laterally between the pyloric CK and the antulae, elongated. So uh, again, it depends upon the uh, breeding season that the size of the gonads either increases or decreases. And the ciliated gonoduct from each gonad opens laterally uh, through a gonopore on the aboral surface along the angle, uh, like, you know, angle of the two arms. So again, there is a genital sac which is present uh, around the gonad and then the wall is made up of muscle and connective tissue fibers and uh, peritoneum on the outside, germinal epithelium inside. And then uh, this is how it is. And when it comes to the development and life history, you get to see that bre they breed in late spring, basically. And uh, the seawater, release of the spermatozoa and the ova into the seawater is controlled by secretion of the neurosecretory cells of the radial nerves. So different scientists have given different kinds of opinions regarding the same. So in Asterias gibosa, around eggs are attached to the stones and reported that a female starfish may produce around two and a half million eggs in two hours. So that's how it is. But uh, then unless fertilization is external, as it occurs in the seawater outside the body, unless fertilization occurs within a short time, sperm and ova cannot survive. That is the reason so many eggs uh, are released at a time. Then the sperm that makes the first contact with the, uh, an ovum penetrates the ovum, fusion takes place, and a zygote is formed. Again, development is with many different larval forms that are present. We'll get to read about the larval forms of the echinodermid soon. So indirect larval forms are there, free sw uh, swimming basically. Egg is either homolecithal or isolethylyl. And you can get to see holoblastic radial indeterminate cleavage. And the four cell stage of the blastomias are totally potent. And then you have a one on the second day, you have a ciliated blastula called as the celoblastula that is formed. And the cavity between inside the celoblastula and uh, uh, is called as the blastocele, having the blastocelomic fluid. And because of invagination or emboli, a two-layered elongated gastrula is formed. That is the outer ectoderm, inner endoderm. And the cavity of the gastrula with the endodermal lining is called as the archentron of the primitive gut. This opens outside through the blastopore, which becomes the anus in the larva. So you have again the early bipinera or the uh, uh, this is the bipinaria larva, in fact, and this is the characteristic feature of the deuterostomes. So, uh, blastopore becoming the anus in the larva. In early bipinaria or diplorular uh, larva, early bipinaria, also called as the diplorular larva, has mouth, esophagus, stomach, intestine. All these parts are present. Then what happens is, uh, like, you know, it is again bilaterally symmetrical, swims with the anterior end forwards in a clockwise uh, rotation. This larva is the fundamental larva of the echinoderms. This gives rise to different kinds of larval forms. Again, this is the life history, as you can see. So adult male, discharge of sperms, female, discharge of the eggs, fertilization, zygote, cleavage, blastulation, blastophopore, divide, uh, like, you know, forming the anus, gastrulation, then early bipinaria, late bipinaria, brachial area larva, young starfish to adult. 
so this is how the life cycle uh, is present so in this again the brachial area larva uh, bipinaria larva uh, uh, forms into the brachial area larva and then they uh, then the side lobes increase in length become long slender ciliated arms and then in addition to this you have the brachial brachiolar arms that are also present and then development of uh, suckers fixation this all this takes place so during metamorphosis you have quite a number of changes taking place so larva settles on the solid substrate gets attached by the suckers bilateral symmetry changes into a radial symmetry preorder lobe gets completely absorbed and mouth larval mouth and anus get closed new mouth anus get formed and then there is a uh, 90 degrees anti clockwise direction uh, rotation so that you know you have the right posterior part with arm rudiments becoming the aboral surface and then you have the ciliated bands larval arms all of these uh, disappear so again when it comes to starfish we have got a good amount of regeneration considerable power of regeneration so one of the arms of the starfish is break it is easy to regenerate this arm especially near the base of the fourth or the fifth umbilical ossicle so again casting off a part of the body of the animal is called as autotomy and then it is a defensive mechanism in which the asteris escapes from the uh, enemies so a single arm with sing a central portion uh, regenerates into a complete arm also a disc without arms also regenerates into a single arm so this is how it is in different kinds of uh, asteris families and now we have the echinodermal larval forms which is uh, kind of important i'll just like kind of share that screen with you uh i'm i'm talking to the administration uh, person directly it's not possible right now i have one more topic to finish so uh, i will have to uh, what do you call it continue if it is okay with the uh, students because this is the last class in fact so please it is a request so uh, you'll have to please stay another 15 20 minutes i'll try to end the class so when it comes to the larval forms in the echinodermates you get to see that uh, you have different kinds of larval forms present asteroidia has bipinaria brachiolaria ophiuroidia has ophio uh, cuteus echinodermia has echino uh, echinopteris and uh, holothuroidia has auricularia crinoidia has doliolaria and pentacrinoid these are the different kinds of larval forms that are present basically you can get to see and gastrula elongates gives rise to the uh, bipinaria larva and then over here it is bilaterally symmetrical the different kinds of flower forms uh, description basically so the preoral region is elongated postoral region is broad so different kinds of arms are present in this particular larval form so finally the digestive system is developed from a with mouth and anus resembles the tornaria not tomeria tornaria larva of the balanoglossus and this larva gets grows into the brachiolaria larva which is bilaterally symmetrical pelagic and uh, medial and ventral positions so these are the different kinds of larval forms i will be sending you the notes of the same thing you can just have a look at them in fact this is the auricularia larva and uh, they are very uh, well developed in uh, what do you call it japan and bermuda for that matter up to 15 mm in length this is the ophiopluteus larva and uh, as seen in the brittle stars long arms bilaterally symmetrical transparent pelagic in nature also they uh, undergo like you know they start swimming for some time then they start uh, undergoing the metamorphosis this is seen in the echinoidea they are microscopic in nature echinopluteus larval forms swims in the water up to four or five different pairs of arms are present usually around six pairs of arms should be present and this undergoes rapid metamorphism develops into the adult 
Doliolaria arma uh, larva is a free swimming uh, larval form again. You have an epithelial tuft of cilia, and in between the third, second, and the third ciliated bands, you have a vestibule that is present. Sig significance is that origin of classes is known because of this. Shows the ancestry from where you know this uh, larval forms have come in, and they also show resemblance with the tornaria of the balanoglossus. So it has a phylogenetic significance also. And uh, so you have retrogressive metamorphosis because of which that has been identified because the larval forms are different from the adult forms. So this is all about the starfishes. Now I will start with uh, the last topic that is phylum hemichordata. In phylum hemichordata, we are just going to see the uh, hemichordates, then the different kinds of, uh, what do you call it, uh, general characteristics. And then we are going to just have a look at balanoglossus. You can expect a couple of questions from them. Disc discuss the affinities of hemichordates. And uh, this is the question that, is, that has been asked earlier also. So when it comes to hemichordates, they are, uh, uh, what do you call it? In, like, you know, they are an independent class amongst invertebrates and between the vertebrates. So they are half part chordates, half part invertebrates, usually vermiform, solitary or colonial cylinderates with or without gills or without, with, without the typical nephidia for that matter, exclusively marine, uh, worm-like animals having a solitary or colonial uh, life, slender, uh, long, fragile bodies with U-shaped tubes that is tubulous mm -hmm. animals and bodies soft adapted for burrowing and uh, the bilaterally... Um, oh symmetrical uh, like you know bilateral symmetry is seen and you have both all the three legium layers that is ectoderm uh, endoderm and mesoderm present body is divided into three unequal parts that is proboscis collar trunk and uh, some of them have tentacular arms on the collar and uh, coelom is of five uh, ha has five cavities and the coelomic cavity is unpaired. Collar trunk have paired coelomic cavities. And they are ciliary fil filter feeders, basically. Single layer of epidermis is present. And uh, they are also mucociliary feeders. Uh, feeders, I mean. Open type of circulatory system present. Capillary system is not present. And they have a dorsal heart, two longitudinal vessels, one dorsal and one ventral. Excretion is by single glomerulus present in the proboscis. Primitive type having only a subepidermal nerve plexus and dorsal collar nerve cord, which is hollow. And, um, and then reproduction is uh, mainly sexual reproduction, dioecious uh, creatures. Gonades are of one to several pairs, external fertilization with direct or indirect free swimming tornaria larva. These are the hemichordates. Example is balanoglossus. Uh, sar sacroglossus, rhabdoplora, etc. So this is how it looks. So again, it is divided into two classes. So enteroneusta and pterobranchia. Enteroneusta is free swimming or sw simple burrowing uh, animals, which are like uh, a, which are called, commonly called acorn or tongue, tongue worms. Another ten minutes, I'll finish the class, please. Elongated vermin form of a, a body with no stalk, and uh, body is uh, having proboscis collared trunk. And the collar is without any kind of tentaculated arms that is lopophore. And you get to see that, you know, straight elementary and all, they are filter feeding organisms. U shaped gill slits are present. Hepatic cica are two pairs. So there are four hepatic cica present in the middle of the trunk. Uh, dioecious creatures, gonades are numerous, scan, uh, and they are scanned like. And development is with or without the uh, tornarial larva. And asexual reproduction is not present. So example is balanoglossus. We are just going to have a type study of that in some time. When it comes to pterobranchia, again, they're solitary, colonial, sessile or tuberculous, minute in size, live in colonies, and uh, shield-shaped uh, proboscis is present, collar based tentaculated arms called lophophore, and uh, lophophore, I mean, and they are ciliary filter feeders. No, uh, no uh, U-shaped tongue bars on the gill slits. Nerve cord is present, single gonad. Sexes may be separated or united. Asexual reproduction is by budding. Development can be direct or indirect. And the classes are, uh, again, two orders of uh, uh, class pterobranchia as seen. One is rhabdoploridia and then cephalodysidia. So they are colonial, connected by a stolon, and no gill slit, single gonad. Example is only single genus, that is rhabdoplura. 
Cephalodysia, again, you have solitary, several zooids are present, single pair of gill slits, single pair of gonads present, example, cephalodiscus and etubaria. So this we have. And uh, the next, we do not exactly have all the rest of the stuff. So I'm going to directly go to the type study that is balanoglossus. We'll just have a look at it. So when it comes to the balanoglossus, it is phylum hemichordata, class enteroneusta, genus balanoglossus, species is clavigerus. It's also known as the equine worm or the tongue worm, and it is exclusively marine, present in the intertidal zones in the warm temperate coasts. Coasts, it is tuberculous, that is, you know, it, it lives in U-shaped burrows on the sandy uh, bottom, basically. And uh, then you get to see that uh, the burrows are open, and anal opening of the burrow is marked by feces that are present that look like earthworm casts. So again, the color you see, it is either uh, like, you know, the hepatic region is brown, Proboscis is yellowish, collar is red, orange red, bronchial region is yellowish orange, and then you have a different kinds of colors in different uh, body parts. And it also emits, emits a strong offensive smell similar to iodoform, which is a protective feature for them. Shape and size, again, body is delicate, soft, and uh, you have mucus that is being sec secreted out. And then the body of the balinoclosis is divided into three regions, that is proboscis, collar, and trunk. trunk. So proboscis is the anterior most region, um, anterior most region of the body, basically short muscular tongue shaped and uh, water enters the proboscis, coelom through the pores, then this makes the proboscis turgid and this, this helps in the effective uh, burrowing organ. Collar or mesosome is the muscular organ and uh, this is the picture basically if you get, get to see. And uh, then you have the collarate also. And mouth is present between the collarate and the proboscis stalk on the ventral side. And trunk or metastome. Trunk follows the collar, a largest part of the body basically. You have the anterior branchiogenital, middle hepatic region, posterior is post-hepatic region. And again, they're again divided. Hepatic circulations are present in the hepatic or the middle region. And it is tapering. Anus is present at the end of the ventral tube. Body wall has uh, ciliated epithelial cells, glands, different kinds of neurosensory cells that are present. Circular muscle fibers are present, longitudinal muscle fibers are present. And then when it comes to the celo, it is lined by celomic epithelium or peritoneum. And uh, proboscis has the proboscis celo, which is an unpaired cavity, glomerulus, buccal diverticulum, dorsal sinus project into this particular uh, proboscis celo. And then the celom, the proboscis and the collar celomic cavities have the celo, uh, sea water, making it turgid, which helps in locomotion. So they contain the celomic fluid also along with the locomo uh, like celomocytes. And when it comes to the skeleton of the, uh, what do you call it, uh, balanoglossus, there are four skeleton structures that are found in the balanoglossus. So one is proboscis skeleton, then you have buccal diverticular branchial celo or a, a branchial skeleton or gill bars and pygocord. So a, a proboscis skeleton is plate-like in structure and uh, it extends from the into the roof of the buccal cavity. Buccal diverticulum is again present on the roof. So do, you have different kinds of uh, names also given to the same buccal diverticulum. Branchial skeleton or gill rods are present. Uh, so primary and secondary gill rods are supported by the uh, uh, gill bars are supported by the gill rods. And then you have a pygocord. This pygocord is a longitudinal rod-like structure extending from the ventral side of the intestine to the body wall. Function is not uh, like uh, no, really known, but maybe it supports the abdomen. So again, digestive system in the alimentary canal, right from mouth to anus. So you have mouth, buccal cavity, pharynx, esophagus, intestine, and anus. So uh, all of these have uh, like, you know, um, uh, the, uh, like, you know, it is a basically, uh, they also have the sphincter muscles, which help in the digestion and passing of the food, undigested food to the anus. So food and feeding habits, if you see through that, balanoglossus is a mucociliary feeder. So water actually, whatever is coming, it is actually a respiratory come food current. So it feeds on the microorganisms and the organic particles present in the water. 
So from the preoral ciliary, ciliary and, uh, organ, this is passed into the mouth by the cilia of the proboscis. And then it is U-shaped over here. There is a proboscis stalk, I mean. Function is to test the nature of the water, food that enters the mouth. Ventral part of the colorate covers the mouth and prevents the entry of undesirable substances into the mouth. So different kinds of enzymes are also secreted this uh, by the hepatic gland. So this hepatic secretions um, uh, contain amylases, maltases, lipases, proteases, so as to digest the different carbohydrates, lipids, prote lipids proteins, etc. Undigested food is sent out as castings. So when it comes to the respiratory system of the balanoglossus, it has two longitudinal rows of gill sacs that are present. And uh, then, uh, uh, like you know, the respiratory organs are the branchial portion of the pharynx bearing gill slits and branchial sacs. So, uh, if you see the course of water current, it is from uh, outside water to mouth to buccal cavity to branchial portion of the pharynx to the gill slits to gill pouches, gill pores, and outside. So, this is the course of uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, course of water current. So, this current water 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 current enters the pharynx through mouth passes through gill slits etc and again exchange of gases takes place diffusion of carbon dioxide to the outside also takes place when it comes to the blood vascular system you get to see that it says it has the closed type of uh, blood vascular system consisting of vessels like in our spaces central sinus center heart vessels two more pages we are done with this particular uh, topic totally so please uh, uh, so please bear with me and you get to see that in this you have arteries and the distributed uh, vessels basically dorsal and ventral vessels situated along the length of the body and uh, then uh, so uh, this is the uh, you can get to see if you click on the link later. So you have the arteries and the distributing vessels which are the mid dorsal proboscis artery mid ventral proboscis artery two efferent uh, uh, glomerular, uh, glomerular uh, arteries. And then when it comes to the collecting of the veins, you get to see that there is a dorsal vessel. And then this dorsal vessel uh, uh, collects the blood through the efferent bronchial vessels. And then through the, uh, it is like, you know, uh, the dorsal vessel dilates to the anterior uh, call end of the column. That is the venous sinus. So this venous sinus receives the lateral proboscis. And uh, on each side, collection of the blood takes place. Anterior flow of blood is in the dorsal vessel posterior flow of blood in the ventral vessel in a non-chordate character. So blood is colorless and uh, presence of respiratory pigment is not exactly known. In the case of excretion, you get to see that the proboscis gland of the glomerulus is the excretory organ and uh, it is, it is uh, converting the urea to uric acid. And then, you know, also peritoneal cells of the proboscis are present. They contain the yellow or the brown excretory matter or, and they are also called as the arthrocytes or paranephrocytes. Sense organs, nervous system, again, you have giant nerve cells present. You have some certain photoreceptor cells that are also present, basically. And when it comes to the reproductive organs, uh, like, you know, you get to see that in the reproduction, regeneration powers are great in balanoglossus. So you have proboscis, collar, pieces of trunk that can completely develop into new individuals. And uh, sexual reproduction takes place. Sexes are separate. Gonades are simple or branched-like uh, structures. Each gonade has a narrow ductule, opens uh, to the exterior by a gonopore. Mature ova and sperms are shed into the seed. Fertilization is external or exogenous. Again, you have a larval form, which is the tornaria larva. This uh, larva is, uh, you know, development is indirect. So with that tornaria larva, cleavage is holoblastic, almost equal. So you have a celoblastula also present and then the blastopore closes. Then the archentron is present, which divides into anterior pot, uh, po, protocell and posterior midcut. So uh, then, you know, similar to that of the, uh, like, you know, uh, it then becomes into the bipinaria larva of the asterius. I mean, in similarity uh, part only. And then the tornaria larva is an oval transparent structure, is around one millimeter to nine millimeters, has two ciliated bands, circumoral ba band helps in food collection. Posterior band, telotroch or circumanal ring. So, you, it, you know, helps in locomotion. So, celomic cavities, heart vesicle and other internal organs are also found in this particular larva. So, when it comes to metamorphosis, you get to see that tornaria larva during the metamorphosis changes in, has this following changes. 
becomes free swimming, settles onto the bottom of the coast, becomes vermiform gradually, constrictions appear, and cilia disappear, telotroch uh, disappears, and eye spots with apical thickening also disappear. The young balanoglossus grows into the adult. Asexual reproduction is also seen. Uh, so what happens is during summer, a small piece from the tail end. Hello? Hello? So the asexual reproduction in, uh, like, you know, is seen in balanoglossus capensis and a small piece from the tail gets cut off, cut off from the juvenile phase. And during next winter, the separated piece becomes an adult sexual type. And you have certain things called as affinities. So how, how does it resemble the, uh, what do you call it, uh, the chordates, echinoderms and annelids? So... In this, you see that the affinities with chordates, they have at least two functional chordate characteristics. That is, first is structure function development of gill slits. So examples is amphiopsis. It, so it is actually called as the fission making. Second is that there's a dorsal nerve cord, which is tubular, non ganglionated as seen in the chordates. Third is that presence of notochord or corda dorsalis on the dorsal side. So many uh, scientists prefer to call it as the buccal diverticulum, in fact, but the di buccal diverticulum is mid dorsal in position. It has vacuolated cells developed from the gut. In possessing these characters, it is, it is similar to that of the notochord or it resembles the notochord. Now, when it comes to the differences with the chordates, you get to see that if the, like, you know, in chordates, gill slits are dorsal in position. In, uh, then they occupy lateral region of the body. The so-called notochord is very short. Chordates occupies entire length of the body. But in hemichordates, buccal diverticulum is ventral to the dorsal blood vessel. And notochord in the chordates, the notochord is actually dorsal in position. So you have a dorsal blood vessel. Hemichordates, you have a non, no covering sheet called as the notochord around the notochord, I mean. But in chordates, you have notochord surrounded by two sheets. Outer sheet made up of elastic connective tissue, inner sheet made up of fibrous connective tissue. In hemichordates, the notochord develops from the foregut but does not get separated from it. And in chordates, from the foregut, but it gets separated. So you have different kinds of gonads also present in hemichordates, but in chordates only, uh, you have around a pair of gonads present. There is no post in a tail in the hemichordates. They are metamerically segmented. So this it is seen clearly by the muscular, nervous, circulatory and excretory systems, whereas there is total absence of segmentation in, uh, I mean, uh, affinity, like, you know, segmentation in the hemichordates. So affinity with annelida, you see, the main resemblance is that the general body form, burrowing habit of the tubulicus forms are uh, like alike. So mud is ingested during the burrowing time, passed out as from the anus as castings. Vascular system is uh, uh, mostly like that of the annelids, blood flowing anteriorly in the dorsal vessel, posteriorly in the ventral vessel. Tornaria a larva is uh, similar to that of the modified tropo uh, troposphere larva of the polychaete worms. Differences, gill slits are absent, paired nerve cords are present in the annelids. So again, Lava of the hemichordates and the annelids also differ in this way, wherein nephridia are absent in the tornadia lava, preoral coelom is absent in the troposphere lava, in troposphere blastopore becomes the mouth, while, whereas in the tornadia lava it becomes the anus. So now the last point that is the affinities with echinodermata. So again, adult hemichordate, adult echinoderms are very different. Strong affinity exists between bipinaria larva of the astradius and tornadia larva of the echino, uh, uh, balanoglossus. Cleavage and gastrula formation is similar. And uh, in both uh, groups, what happens is uh, the, la the uh, larvae, the ciliary band, uh, take a similar course. You have coelom developing from the archentron and you have mouth ventral anus posterior develops into the blastopore in both the anus. I mean, the origin and uh, arrangement of the coelomic cavities are exactly same in both. In adult uh, uh, conditions, both have a poorly developed nervous system and heart vesicle of the hemichordates may be homologous to the madriporic vesicle of the echinoderm larva. 
So this is all about uh, the, what do you call it, uh, the differences. And you can see that, uh, again, differences are also being uh, given. You can read it once I uh, kind of uh, send you this particular link. I'll be sending in some time. So summary is that, you know, it is a tube-dwelling worm-like organ, uh, uh, organism having proboscis, collar, and trunk. And uh, coelom has five separate cavities. And uh, sexes are separate. Nervous system is formed in the form of plexus lodged in the epidermis. So the development is indirect with a tornaria larva. So this is all about the hemichordates as well. So I'm done with this particular uh, unit as such. So if there are any doubts, you can always ask uh, later. But otherwise, okay. we are done with it. I will send the PowerPoints uh, maybe, you know, today or tomorrow. Okay. Okay. okay.